the exercise or whatever that is, you know, maybe you started exercising more and more. So if you could simply uh, put into the chat one small thing you did to make a change that would benefit you, that would be fantastic. What? Okay, so I heard from, I'm hearing from Laura. I cut out about 300 calories, started working out three days a week. That is excellent, Laura. Thank you so much. Uh, I hear from Doug, less, a little less caffeine. Yes, caffeine is not the ultimate secret. That's great. Lacey, daily walks during your breaks, exercising four days a week. This is great. I uh, stood up when my, when my watch told me to, so you're using technology to your advantage. This is fantastic. Dana? So I, bought, I uh, went back to the treadmill 30 minutes, three times a week, taking walks with coworkers. This is great feedback. I am so thankful to hear that you're taking advantage of the science, of some of these concepts that we've been sharing with you. Lisa says, I cut way back on drinking soda. Yes, uh, it was none, It was none, but slipped up a little when I, when I had a friend. I understand that, things happen. There's, there's, that's not a problem. Getting up and moving. Uh, throughout the day, Maria says, okay, so this is great. So some of you are now really starting to take advantage of the science that we've been sharing with you. And I'm really excited to, uh, to see that, you know, right now, this, this evening, we're going to be focused on our minds. And this is where we get our focus. This is where we get our, 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 our concentration, you know, and this is where really the storytelling begins to really take place. So as we go through this process, I'm going to ask you to step into what we call the stretch zone. This is where we step into discomfort for the sake of growth. And so what we need, what I need you to understand is that we all have a salience network and it's really a group of uh, regions in the brain whose sole focus, whose primary fo focus and purpose is to determine what is a threat and what's not a threat. It really serves as a filter to allow in what is needed and to filter out what is not necessary for you at that time. And so I want to go back to when Lauren talked about the fundamentals of stress. And she asked you to write down one thing that was bringing you stress at that time. So if you would, if you kindly pull that out, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about that. So if you don't have it with you, just rewrite that down very quickly. When she asked you that question, what was one thing that was bringing you stress right now? Uh, take a moment and write that down or, or pull it out, if you will. Okay, so the two questions I wanna really ask you is this. What was the impact of that stress? How did it really affect you? So I want you to take a moment, write that down. How did that stress honestly affect you? Did it disturb your sleep? Maybe it was uh, it impacted your relationships in some way, maybe at home or some with some of your colleagues at, we, at work, or maybe with some of the children uh, that you deal with. How did it impact you? The second question is this, when you take a look at what you wrote, did it honestly warrant your stress? Did it warrant your concern? So I don't have your first name, but El Garcia says, I became very ill during a high stress situation. So here's the thing, uh, what we don't hear, what we don't do here is ignore real issues or real problems. That's not what we do here. You know, your, your situations are real and the emotions that go along it, with it are real. We don't ignore real issues and we don't ignore real problems. You know, sometimes in some cases it does warrant your stress. We get that. We understand that. But oftentimes we worry about things that don't even come into fruition. We worry about a burning bridge that we may not even have to come across. So that's the reason why I ask you, did it really warrant your stress? Here's what I need you to know. Every single day, we wake up with a weapon that can work with us or be forged against us. And that is our minds. Why? Because we are constantly telling ourselves stories all 
day long, nonstop. And so we are meaning makers. When we don't have all the facts, uh, when we don't see all the data points, what we have a tendency to do is fill in the gap with stories to connect the dots. And so we're going to do a little role play to kick this thing off, this whole storytelling piece off. And I'm going to show you a video. I'm a detective. I'm going to show you a video of something that's taking place. And what I want you to do is write in the chat what you see taking place so that I can gather all the clues and be able to formulate my own story from the words you use, okay? So take a look at the story and please uh, be as detailed as you want. Oops. And take a look at this now. So that was just absolutely riveting, wasn't it? <laughs> so again, put it in the chat because I want to hear from you. What did you see taking place in that moment during that video? Uh, so thank you, Barney. You said a bully. You saw a bully in that video. Who else? Domestic violence. Lost Lots of aggression, Stacy. Lots of aggression. Thank you for sharing. What else do we see in that? Remember, I'm trying to compile all this information. I'm the detective. Fighting. So there was a fight that went down, and there was some sort of. Uh, they knew each other because there was domestic violence that was taking place. A lot of anger there. Destroying your own safe place out of fear. Thank you, Naranjo. The big triangle is trying to make the other two shapes do something they don't want to do. Uh, Joanne said there's a lot of fear here. Well, well thank you for sharing. Uh, um, it's interesting. These, this video was shown to a group of college students uh, who volunteered to participate in this, in this study conducted by Heider and Simmel in the 1940s, hence the old film footage. And they were using a lot of words similar to yours, bully, anger, uh, fear, rage. And the whole idea is this, is that this video would simply demonstrate how we ascribe meaning to what we see and the things that we experience. So as we get into this, what we need to understand really is how our minds work. And our minds, are made up of billions and billions of neurons. So every single time we experience something new, our neurons will fire off to process what is actually taking place. If we have an emotional response, our brains will take a snapshot, freeze it, package a neurological pattern that, and that we call a memory. If the emotional response is, is if significant, if it's immense, it's very intense, it's overwhelming, it can capture the entire intention of the brain and we can begin to process new information through an old, possibly dysfunctional neural pathway. Example, 
you know, this is in my own family. Many, many years ago, many decades ago, my aunt used to live with my family and it was my uh, mother's sister. And while she was living there, my, my father was up for this massive job opportunity, which would have changed the financial trajectory of our household. And she, sab my aunt, sabotaged the entire thing. And that betrayal, obviously a strong, you know, rendered a strong emotional response from my mom. And out of that, a story emerged. It was actually, honestly, a phrase. And that was whenever anything new or exciting was coming or on the horizon, or there was a potential for something good or great, the response was, but don't say anything. Don't say, don't tell anybody. Because if we tell someone, we, there's the, always the potential for somebody to sabotage. It. The reason why I say this is because you know, what are the stories that we tell ourselves when we get hit with that stress? What does it sound like? What does it look like? What are the stories that are floating around your classrooms that you share with your colleagues? Or maybe even floating around in your own households. What are some of the stories that your children are beginning to pick up on now? Because that phrase has passed on down to my siblings, to my brothers, and to my sisters. So that, you know, and this is the reason why it happens. All of us, each one of us, we have what we call a negative bias. In fact, we react three times as strongly to a negative stimuli than we do a positive one. And that's part, all part of the whole fight or flight thing. Remember, uh, our, our lizard brain is constantly scanning the world for threats. You know, we live in that space 94% of the time. So there's that. The other piece to it though, is that to strengthen this whole storytelling habit, our brains have an internal reward system. So every single time we complete a cycle or, or a pattern or a puzzle, our brains reward us with dopamine. And that is a short-term pleasure cycle. So we get hooked into telling ourselves the same story over and over and over again, whether it's a good story or a bad story, we get hooked into this cycle. How many of you have ever had a colleague at work or, or, or maybe even a best friend or maybe some of you even within your own family household and they're dealing with this issue and it's, it's a problem they've been wrestling with for a while and you're sitting there looking like the answer is right in front of them. Like, all you got to do is this and you can get over it. And for whatever the reason they can't see it, have you ever dealt with somebody like that? Maybe a friend or somebody within your own household, or maybe it's a, uh, a sibling that they're stuck on something and, and they, their answer is very simple. It's very clear to you. It's right in front of them, but for whatever the reason, they can't grasp it. Anybody ever had that happen to them? Yes, uh, Stacy says, currently dealing with that with my best friend. So you, you understand, Stacy, you understand what I'm talking about. Here's why they can't move past this. Because the story that they're telling themselves is too powerful. So they become stuck. We get stuck telling ourselves these same stories. And eventually, honestly, they become our hangups. You know, much of the reason why we there's a misalignment with um, our passion or our purpose or our mission or our values isn't so much the stress that hits us. More often than not, it's the stories that we tell about that stress over and over and over again. And it ends up driving our behaviors and our habits and even our identities as well. So here, I'm gonna show you a couple of stories that um, we've heard a lot of our clients say. And what I would like for you to do is put them in the chat, which ones that you said before to yourself, or maybe out loud to a friend. Okay, so take a look at this. So one through nine, I'll just read some of them off. This challenge can't help me grow. I have to handle this all alone. I don't wanna ask for help. No one can do this better than me. I can't handle this. This is, this is just too much. I'm not enough and I'll never be enough at work or at home. 
in a time like this, I don't have time for self-care and exercise, sleep, to take weekends off. What? Are you kidding me? My family understands why I'm disengaged and disconnected right now. They get it. My team, my students expect me to work harder and longer. So I'll stay up later and work longer, uh, work the weekends to show honestly that I care. I care about my students. This change or challenge that is, it's gonna, it's just overwhelming and it's gonna crush me. We can't possibly recover. And, and nobody, nobody could possibly understand what I'm going through right now. So let's hear from you. So Stacy, Stacy, you said two, three, five, and eight, and 10. So uh, I have to handle this all alone, you've said. And number three, I don't want to ask for help. No one can do this better than me. Laura, you were saying number seven, my family understands why I'm disconnect, disengaged and disconnected right now. They get it. And so Tara, I've told myself number six, in a time like this, I don't have time for self-care. El Garcia, two and five, I have to handle this alone. I'm not enough. And Chris, you were saying two, four, and five, I can't handle this. This is too much. Maria, number six, um, no time for self-care. Tanya, no sign of time for self-care. So I'm seeing a lot, I'm saying that, that many of you have said some of these statements before. Here's what I need you to be careful of, right? And, and I see Denise saying two, four, five, and seven. So the family thing, uh, I'm not enough. I, I get it, I get it. We are under a ton of pressure. Thank you for sharing and thank you for being authentic and thank you for being real because uh, we are now stepping into the stretch zone. Here's what I need you to understand or be, or be cautious of. Sometimes what we have a tendency to do is to stack our stories. Example, uh, last year, my son, my wife and I, we have three kids and my son came home. He's in high school. He came home and said, you know what, dad? Everybody at school hates me. Everybody. And I'm like, well, you know, I know this isn't true, but I said, well, wait a minute, where, where are you getting this from? Well, today uh, during football practice, I dropped a touchdown pass and the defense started laughing at me. I'm like, well, that happens. He's like, no, 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 you know, Kayla didn't go out with me. I asked her out last month and she rejected me. She turned, she shot me down. And earlier, you know, so back in September, Brian, he wouldn't be my science partner. And nobody likes me. How many of us, have done something like that before, we, we begin to stack our story, stress response after stress response after stress response. Maybe you've had a year where you've said, you know what, this entire class, all my kids, they're just, they're, this is a horrible class this year. It's going to be terrible. You know, uh, Stephanie, she's failing. She's not getting it. Joe and John, they're just joking around. They goof off the entire time. And Larry, he, he's lost in space somewhere. You know, he can't, he can't even focus. How many of you have, have taken times, maybe different areas, whether it be at work or at home or with relationships, begin after a stress response, you begin to stack your stories. Anybody ever done that before? Stacy, yep. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, here's the good news. We can stack them positively or we can stack them negatively. We need to understand that. But we have to be cautious of what takes place. So, uh, Satara so saying uh, to my husband, uh, I do that all the time. Yes, we do. We, we do it to the closest people that we love the most. Of course, it's real talk. This is what happens in our homes when we go home. Denise saying, yes, Maria agreeing. Yes, this is what happens. So we have to be mindful what the story looks like when we get hit with that stress, uh, stressful situation, what that stress response is doing to us. What does it really look like? And so what I'm gonna do now is uh, we're gonna do a quick exercise. And I'm gonna show you a list again of, of different statements that you've said. And I'm gonna give you the opportunity to reframe it. Uh, I'm going to have you rewrite it. And this is just a practice run here. So let's take a look at this. Take a look at some of these stories or, or one-liners or statements. Perhaps you've said them before. 
And I want you to write, I used to think this, I used to think that I don't have time for lunch or breaks, but now I know blank. Now I know I need to, because it's going to impact my performance. It's going to impact my energy levels. It helps me, uh, it helps me be sustainable throughout the day. You know, when, when I get hungry, I'm not as empathetic. I can't relate and I get a little hangry. So take a statement. I used to think this, I used to say this, but now I know. I'm gonna give you a few minutes, I'm gonna give you five minutes to take us this one of these statements and rewrite it. Again, this is nothing but a practice run. Take a shot at this. You know, my job is who I am. Without my job, I am nobody. People say these things. I'll give you one more minute and then we'll dive back in.
So I want to now take a moment and respond to some of the, uh, the chat is very active. And so again, I wanna thank all of you uh, for sharing, I really do. Um, so I'll start with El Garcia, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know your first name, but she said that, uh, or I think he or she said that, uh, I used to say, I can't handle this, but I've been handling more than I ever thought I could. That is awesome, that is a way to reframe this. Laura. I can focus on my health after this is over. Uh, you say this, but now I know that if I don't put myself first, then I can't perform the best at my job and be present with my family. That is that is excellent. Now we're getting it. Uh, Leela agrees. I love the support. Uh, Satara, when I when I make time, uh, when I make the time to walk during my day with my coworkers, it makes me happy. I can see the difference when I don't, uh, when I do and when I don't. Excellent. Stacy, uh, maybe everyone else needs 79 hours of sleep, but I've been trained, but I've trained my body to thrive off of five no longer. Now I make sure I get at least seven hours of sleep so that I'm rested and more energized for the day. That is excellent, Stacy. Thank you. And uh, Alicia, let's see. I used to care more about what others thought, but now I know what I think is more is more healthy. It was more of a healthy focus. Excellent. Denise, I used to think multitasking was the only way to get things done. Now I know I accomplish more by taking one uh, one thing at a time. Very good. We're gonna get into that actually. I uh, I can't see the whole name here. I used to think that. Sleeping six hours was enough. Now I know that my well-being and my mental health improves when I sleep seven or more hours. That is very observant. That's the awareness that we're talking about. Excellent. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, from an iPhone, I can't handle this. Dealing with the death of my dad in December, allowing myself to grieve and surround myself with people who loved him and me has helped me through this difficult time. And you know what, I wanna pause here because that is critically important. You know, your environment, the people that you surround yourself with, especially when you're dealing with, it, with an extreme situation such as the loss of a loved one. So thank you uh, for whoever shared that, that is critically important. Um, and you know, the grieving process, everyone responds to that differently and so, you know, as long you take as long as you need to do when it comes to that, but you need to surround yourself with the right people. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Cecilia, I must be, I must be a weirdo because I didn't feel that way before or now. Okay, good. Um, I, used to, I used to think I exercise at home. It would take away from my time with my family, but now I know that I am better a wife and mom when I do so. Excellent. Uh, Kylie, I used to think I was not qualified for my job, but now I know that everyone is a is a continue is a continuous learner, no matter what the profession. That's excellent. So this is the reframing that I'm talking about. This is so critically important that we do this. That then this is like so. What's happening here? You know, as you rewrite these stories, um, what we're doing is we're shifting, and. What we're becoming is an intentional storyteller. This is when we take a moment to pause and step into our old, perhaps dysfunctional story that we've been telling ourselves and examine it, face it, own it, and rewrite it. That's what that practice is. But in order to do that, you have to create a level of awareness. You have to create the time to pause Create that level of awareness. What is floating around my mind right now when the stress hits me? How am I responding? What does it really look like? Is it the right story that I'm telling myself? So I want to take a moment now. I want you to go back to that original stress that you're dealing with. And I want you to take a moment and rewrite it. I'll give you just a couple of minutes to do that. What's the story? What's the story that you were telling yourself around that original stress that you were facing? Face it, face that story. And then I'll give you a moment to reframe it. What's the, where's the opportunity in this? Can you see the opportunity in this?
So again, right now we're, we're taking that old story that, that's dealing with that stress, that original stress that we were talking about and taking a moment, taking the opportunity right here, right now to reframe it. Where's their opportunity? When you finish writing, uh, rewriting that, put in the chat. You don't have to tell me your story. Just tell me, uh, are you good with what you wrote? Do you see the opportunity there? Do you see a new opportunity there? If you could share that, that would be helpful. Okay, so Garcia, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your, your first name, but you're saying that I cannot reframe the horrific event that I was in, but I can retrain uh, my brain to think of a happy and safe place and use deep breathing to calm myself. So you have to deal with your own triggers. You have to figure out a way to deal with your triggers. And sometimes the events that we experience are horrific. You're absolutely right. Again, like I said in the beginning, we don't ignore real issues or real problems. Sometimes people experience things that are completely devastating and it is what it is. There's no getting around it. We have to face it and we own it. But the key here and to your point, which you've just done though, which you need to see happening, we don't want you to get stuck and stay there. But and here's the reason why you didn't because what you're doing, you're saying you can retrain your brain to think of a happy and safe place and use deep breathing to move through that space. Remember, agility is not bouncing back from stress because sometimes you know that stress doesn't end right away. We want you to be able to maneuver through stress. That's what this is all about here. Sometimes the stress doesn't end. We've been in a pandemic. It's not over yet. It's not. We don't know when this is going to end. The vaccines are coming. This is great, but it takes time. We want you to be able to move through it. So thank you, Garcia, for, for uh, sharing that. Maria saying definitely a mindset shift. So here's what I need you to understand what's taking place uh, from a neurological piece here. So you are firing off these neurons over here with this old story you were telling yourself. And what you do every single time you reframe this and tell yourself this new story, you are starting to fire off a new neural pathway. And that will end up driving your behavior even through stress. Sandra says, yes, I worry about my elderly parents, but now I know that I can share the responsibility with my siblings and not take it on all by, by all on my own. Sandra, thank you for sharing that because it's huge. A lot of times we get in situations and we say, I got to do this all by myself. It can, it can become completely overwhelming. You know, I'm dealing, my siblings and I are dealing with an elderly, my mom, she's 85 years old and we're trying to figure out what to do. The good news is, you know, I know that I can count on my siblings. We all have to pitch in, you know, and every family's different. You may have one or two people that don't want anything to do with that particular family member or their parent. It gets difficult, but you're, you're able to reframe it. And this is good, Sandra. Stacy, uh, realizing I don't have to do for everyone else, uh, realizing I don't have to do for everyone else, it is, it is okay to be a little selfish with my own time and learning how to say no is okay. Yes. Learning how to say no, Stacy. thank you. So remember this, 
every single time we say yes to something, we're saying no to something else. So to your point, Stacy, every single time you say yes to your, your students all the time or your, your colleagues all the time at school or even you know, within your own household, you're saying no to your personal space in your personal time. And we need that. We need that. Remember, we needed that oscillation that we've always talked about. Remember the BRAC, how our cycles work. We need this time. We need this space to be able to power down in order to power up and perform at a high level and maneuver through stress. So thank you uh, for sharing this. So let's go a little lighter here. And let's talk about something that uh, we can all relate to, and that is multitasking. And I saw somebody uh, brought this up earlier, the whole multitasking thing. I can't, there's so many, so many chats now, I, I can't find it. But uh, you alluded to this and this whole multitasking. And I know many of you say, I've heard so many business professionals say, I have to be able to multitask in order to even survive in this nonstop world. The reality is, the truth of the matter is, it is impossible for us to multitask. It's impossible. We can't do it. We have a binary system. We're either focused on something or we're not focused on something. Yeah, and we, we really define multitasking as your attempt to execute, execute two or more cognitive jobs or tasks concurrently. Computers can do this. Human beings can't. In fact, when we try to, our focus becomes diminished. So think about this for a moment. Imagine if you had 25 to 30 students in your classroom and all of them at the exact same moment started screaming out the answer to 30 different questions. You wouldn't be able to process all of it. Now you can go from student to student to student to student, but not all at the exact same moment. And so I ask you, you know, we're great serial taskers. That's the difference. We can go from student to student. But my question to you is this, if we know that it diminishes our focus and it's really, it's the enemy of excellence, where, do we find ourselves multitasking at work? You can put it in the chat. Are there spaces there at work that you begin to find yourselves multitasking? Anybody at work? Uh, during my break at lunchtime? Okay, <laughs> that's okay. You're relaxing during your break, that's fine. Uh, during emails, thank you, Barney. During emails, absolutely. We do that, people do that all the time. Uh, what about at home? Um, when I'm grading papers. Okay, Laura, when you're at work and you're grading papers, trying to multitask. And, and honestly, it slows down the process. The research, the science shows that when we try and multitask, it's the, so if you're grading papers, for example, and if you're, if you're on the phone or, or trying to do emails, it slows down uh, your cognitive function. So it will take you twice as long, or nearly twice as long to grade those papers. On the phone and answering emails. Thank you, Chris. Let's, let's switch for a moment. Uh, uh, yeah, we only have a 15 more minutes here or 20 more minutes here. And I want to get to the home front. Where do you find yourselves multitasking at home? This is important. So think when I, when I ask you this question, think about the people you're at home with, or may, maybe if you live alone, maybe it's with your friends. What does that scene look like? And you're watching TV, kitchen during uh, in the kitchen during dinner. So when you're cooking, okay. So how many of you though have had, I don't know how many of you have kids or, or, or people at home that you're living with, how many of you have had a child or a family member or a spouse come and try and communicate to you or with you while you're watching TV or while you're trying to do something else, while you're multitasking? I'm asking you honestly, what, what is the signal that you sent that person who Ideally, you love the most, you know, in most situations, you love the most. What's the signal that you send to that person? When they're trying to communicate their day or maybe something that they're, they're, they're dealing with, an issue. 
I'm really not that interested about what you're saying. You're irritating. <laughs> you're irritating me. All right. All right. Thank you. Naran just says I, I tell them to give me a minute and I'll be with them in just a second. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. It makes them feel, uh, Howie. It makes them feel un, not important. Now, here's the other piece. For those of you, I don't know how many of you do, but for those of you who have kids, here's the other signal that you sent. And that is, it is okay for me to be treated like that. So if my mother or my father, the people who love me most in the entire world, treats me like this, and they love me the most, then it is okay for me to be treated like, to be treated in this way. That's the signal that we sent. So Chris, you roll your eyes while pausing your favorite show. Roger that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Uh, but here's the, here's the other piece. I want to get into this too. Um, how many of you are, there's so many distractions out there. One of them is our phones. How many of you honestly are tethered to your phone? You know, here's some stats. Here's some data. 86% of smartphone users will check their device while in conversation with friends and family. That's exactly what I was alluding to. Uh, the average smartphone user unlocks their phone 150 times a day, 150 times a day. I don't know, uh, I don't know that many things that we do 150 times during the day, I honestly don't. Maybe walk, I, I don't know, steps. 75% of users admit to texting during driving regularly, 75%, 40% of users admit to using their phone while in the bathroom. Anybody want to join that club? 12% admit it. How many, how can you use the term the shower? I don't know. This is anyway, these are some data points. Uh, Maria saying guilty. Is that to the bathroom Maria or no, I'm just joking. I'm, I'm just joking. Anyway, let's move on. So here's something interesting. You know, there was a study uh, that was recently conducted in 2009 out of the University of Washington. Um, and this, this doctor, Dr. Heidel, was um, trying to figure out the number of people that noticed a clown on a unicycle that was passing by them at various points, at various intersections. And you know, this is what the results were. When they were walking with a friend, 71% of them noticed, hey, this. What's that clown doing over there? Listening to music, 61%. Walking alone, 51%. Looking at their phone, 8%. Just 8%. Think about that. And that was back in 2009. So think about all the different social media platforms that we have now where, you know, uh, whether it's Snapchat or Instagram or whatever it is, it's pretty significant. So my question to you is, with all of these distractions that are taking place, where are you where are you finding these distractions where is it hitting you because they can add more stress where are you adding this this mental clutter as we call it is it someplace that, is it a particular time at school maybe is it at home where is this taking place and is it okay with you like what's the driver what's the belief behind that are you saying i have to do this these things are all on my plate. I have to. Cecilia is saying nowadays I see more people looking at their phones when they're when they cry. Yeah, that's true, Cecilia. I see that too. But where do you find yourselves being distracted the most? So take a moment. I want you to write that down. Where think about your day, reflect on your day. Where do you see yourself being distracted the most throughout the day? Could be at work, could maybe even be at home. So this is interesting. Uh, a lot, uh, I have a few of you saying at home, you find yourself distracted at home between 5 and 7 p.m. on the during the weeknights. You, Stacey, that's you. Hallie's agreeing. You're saying at home, Marie at home. 
I'm most distracted at home. Okay, so go take a step further. Why are you distracted at home? And are you okay with that? What's causing this distraction? What's the belief? What's the story behind it? So Stacy saying, no, I'm not okay with it, but I have to maintain focus at work. So in order to get things done, uh, in order to get things completed, I have to multitask when I'm at home with the kids, okay? So these are the stories that we tell ourselves. But we can, you know, and again, everyone's situation is different and I totally respect that, I honestly do. But these are stories that we do tell ourselves. Uh, work emails or, uh, work emails and things I need to do when I get home, finding time for it all. Yes, Tara's another one. I'm a single mom and an adult child. I get bored and lonely. So I have to find myself. So I find myself tuning to my, turning to my device for entertainment. Okay, I understand that. But my bottom line at the end of the day is, is it okay for you in your situation? If it's okay, then fine. It's your life, that's fine. If it's not, you have an opportunity to restructure your life just a little bit. And again, these are the small steps that we're talking about, those micro steps, those, those atomic steps. What is one small thing we can do in shifting our mindset around these stories? So maybe, you know, for those of you who have, the, have kids or maybe you're a single mom or a single dad, maybe it's, you know, I know for my kids, right? Um, you know, my wife and I have three kids, uh, two of whom are teens, all doing virtual so we're just loving this season, honestly. But I know that like when I step out of my office, I can, I can hang out with them, but they only require 15 to 20 minutes. And then they're going to go off and do what they're going to need to do. You know, they go off and they're either doing homework or, or they're talking to their friends or whatever it is. So maybe you carve out that time. You rewrite the story to carve out that time uh, for your children and then get back to work. But here's why, here's why I bring up this whole distraction piece. It's critically important because it can cause higher anxiety and it can cause you to stress out more. And when you, when you talk about this whole multitasking, it can exasperate your stress. So that's the reason why I do bring this up. So some solutions. I don't want to leave you hanging. So here's some mindfulness solutions that you can attempt to do. Eliminate distractions where you can. Uh, write journal. It slows down. when you write and you journal things. It slows down the thoughts that are uh, that are going through your head. Your thoughts are so fast and they're so fleeting. Um, declutter your workspace. That's a prioritization exercise for yourself. These are some of the things that you can do. Um, here's another mindfulness exercise you can do when you're starting to get overwhelmed. To calm and to slow everything down. We give you the three, two, one. Three things you can see, two things you can hear, one thing you can feel. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to identify that right now. What are three things you can see? Write it down really quickly. 30 seconds. Ready, set, go. Attack. How'd that go for you? We are we able to identify three things that you could see, a couple things you could hear within your own household. This is just a simple mindfulness exercise to slow everything down for you. So you, 
uh, Maria saying you get it, uh, you can see your computer screen, see your dog and, and, and see your TV screen. Okay, a computer couch and window, computer dogs blanket. Okay, it may, Lori, it made me smile. Well, I'm happy that it made you smile. Yeah, I'm happy that it made you smile. That's great. Uh, we're gonna wrap here with one more important thing that uh, I think we all need to do and another mindfulness strategy. And that is uh, meditation, right? And we know this, we, there's a lot of studies, there's a lot of research out there, reduces mind wandering, improves our focus. Um, you know, it, uh, it really reduces symptoms of anxiety and, and depression and improves our emotional regulation, reduces the impact of that stress response so what we're gonna do here is, is we're gonna take two minutes to meditate. And here's the key. So when you get hit with that stress response, when you're, um, your heart is racing and your breathing is accelerating, the key here to trigger that parasympathetic is through your breathing. That's the trigger. You can trigger your parasympathetic nervous system through your breathing by slowing it down. So we're going to do this mindfulness. We're going to meditate for two minutes. And a lot of people ask me, which the best, which, what are some of the best apps out there for this? I like Headspace. There's also Stop, Think, and Breathe. But the, when you go through this, I want you really to process and focus on your breathing. Your mind will wander. I want you to bring it back to your breathing. I'll give you a moment. I'll give you two minutes. Oops. Ready, set, go. time. How'd that go? You can put it in the chat. Was it calming? Was it relaxing? Thanks, Stacy. Very relaxing. Okay. Very relaxing. Okay. So again, this is nothing but a tool. When you're feeling like that, the idea is to establish some triggers to slow everything down. This is one of them. I know, uh, Lauren, she, you know, when she gets overwhelmed with something, she gets hit with a stress response to put things in perspective, she'll say to herself, and this is her trigger, um, house is not on fire, kids are safe. She goes right to that. And it's like, it puts everything in perspective. We all have to have our own triggers, right? And we always, we have to figure out ways to slow things down. And the other piece is to create that oscillation process and disconnect, find ways to disconnect. Here's one last video I wanna kind of leave you with really fast. And this is, um, 
called Disconnect to Connect. Take a listen to this. That was actually a commercial uh, that they produced over in Asia. I forgot what company it was for, but the idea was as much as we love technology, we have to find ways to disconnect from it, to reconnect with the people and things that we love the most. Uh, any takeaways, any final questions before we wrap here? You can put them in the chat. Any questions or comments? So I'll leave you with this. Uh, just remember, if there's no other comments or questions, think about when you get hit with that stress response, think about the story that you are telling yourself in that moment in time. And where is the opportunity within that stress? How can you reframe it? Just think about that. Again, uh, I see, I, I'm glad that you liked the videos. That was great. It's one of my favorite videos too. It gives you a moment to just disconnect for a moment. But if there are no other comments, I'll, I'll give you another minute for questions or comments. Uh, if there's anything that was unclear that I can make clear for you. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for attending. I really appreciate it. I, I wish you well in your journey. And I want you to, whatever you do, maneuver, stay on mission and maneuver through stress. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Take care. Bye-bye.